Magic is an amazing and wonderful thing. I started practicing magic back in 1993. I know this because I remember going and buying my first book, Celtic Magic by DJ Conway. Yeah, probably not the best book to start with, but it's where I started and it's always fine to start wherever you start. I've been practicing magic for a really long time, and I know you have too. I'd say I probably started at some of my earliest memories, and I definitely started much more in the wild sort of way, having conversations with the spirits and stuff that were around, and just getting into how to work the subtle arts of the brain and the way the brain works and other subtle arts. We got, got to talking and with a lot of people getting very interested in magic. And I know for a chunk of our audience had not even thought about the practice of magic before. We thought it would be interesting to take some time and talk about some things you wish we'd known before we started our magical practice. Come along with us as we have this conversation as we walk together down creation's paths. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie. I am a Christo Pagan Druid and Priest of Bridget. Good everyone, my name is Brian. I am sous chef to the doctor. And boy, I wish I had this list so I wouldn't have run down into folly many a time. So it would have saved a lot of time. We're gonna rush through the intro here because we really want to get into a lot of this just because we want to hit as many as we can without going too far over our usual runtime. If you haven't already, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever the terminology is on the app that you're currently listening to us on. We do five original Christo Pagan and Druid episodes every week, and you don't want to miss anything. We've got a lot of good topics lined up for you, and we're always willing to take your suggestions in hand. All right, so let's just get to it. So the first thing that I want to mention that I wish I knew before getting started in magic is... You don't have to buy anything. You don't. You don't have to buy anything. Now, books can be very helpful, but we're living in kind of a golden age of magic and paganism. While I would still say, if you can get some of the books and, and learn, that will be very helpful. But with Ivy the Occultist and the Norse Witch and the Activist Witch and your Chaotic Witch Ant, and all of these wonderful channels that are online. No, I'm missing a bunch of channels and no Motino shade on that. Yeah, if you want to do some deep dives into esoteric <laughs> history, esoterica, and there are so many free resources that are out there. Angela's Symposium is, is out there. Mavis Lynn, if you're more interested in Thelema, which I am not, but I find her videos fascinating because I get to see this entire world that I don't participate in. There, there's a lot of free resources out there. Not to mention a lot of the classics have entered the public domain. So it's much easier to get your hand on Dion Fortune's work or Alistair Crowley's work or whoever. A lot of this is also available in the Internet Archive. So there are a lot of places that you can go and read these classics. Like if you're interested in tarot, A.E. Waite's book, which kind of all modern tarot what you inspired by, whether they know it or not, it's free online in a lot of different places. So you can read his ori original book on tarot for yourself for free. Just beyond the book side and the learning side, you don't have to have the crystals, the cauldrons, the wands, and all of the gloriously wonderful stuff that is out there now. Because I remember when I got started with magic, we had one magic shop in town. I was living in Frederick, Maryland, and we had Foxcroft in town, and they sold incense and books and some tarot and oracle cards and, and some jewelry. Eventually, they got wands and it built up over time, but it wasn't a lot that was out there. Today, especially with the advent of Etsy, anything your heart desires, you can probably find pre-made. One, if you can, try to make your own magical tools whenever possible, but you don't need them. Ones are great. Ones are good for focusing your energy, but you don't have to have one. So don't spend a lot of money. That's not necessary to get started. You need to guard yourself against this instinct for what I like to call spiritual materialism. So that's the thing number one I wish I knew before we started. Number two, number two, I, it's what I lovingly call the core things, those essential things. Take the time in the beginning, find out what is core and essential to you 
that will also be core and essential to your practice. It will influence your faiths, your beliefs, everything in your entire life, honestly. Indeed. Also with that comes the caveat of remembering the core things are generally few things that are essential and everything else that is added on is added on. That's the personal inflection of it. What is you at your core? And also what is magic at its core? Just as a corollary onto that. I don't know if it's a separate one or not, but once you start understanding, like there are certain basics that everyone's going to practice, whether you're practicing the high magic of the golden dawn or Thelema, or if you're just doing kitchen witchery when, when you're cooking for your family, we all define ritual the same. We sometimes add different elements in to fancy it up, but the core essentials of ritual are always the same. The core ritual, the core elements of spell work are always the same. The core, uh, core elements of okay. spirit work, yeah. energy work. And so you talk to people that are mediums, they're going to tell you the same thing as people who do journeying because it's all the same. And so once you start realizing that there's these core elements and the rest of it, it's the customary, it's the dressing that might help you connect better to the practice. But they're just that. A lot of it's either personal inflection, cultural inflection, other little bits added on. It's not bad that it's added on, but it's recognizing what is at its core and what is the extra dressing. The next one that I feel is so important and probably should have been our first one, but this is a twofer because I think they're saying the same thing, but differently. Everyone can do magic. Everyone is psychic. I, I think it, it's that Pam office meme that I refer to so often. They're the same picture. It's just different terms and different language for things. Clairvoyance and voyaging are pretty much the same practice. And we you go down the list with all of them. Everyone has access to this power. Everyone has access to these abilities. It's just about exercising it and strengthening it. Now, you may not be great at all of them. Like clairaudience is something I am very bad at. I can't hear. I am fairly deaf when it comes to any of the experiences that I'm having. I don't have an auditory experience, but I am fairly clairvoyant, which means I see very visually what, what is going on. I am also very clairsentient, which means I can feel what's going on. And usually I get a gist of what's going on, which is why I'm always shocked when I say no. And I heard clearly because that almost never happens to me. And my friends, when they hear me say that, no, oh, wow. Like yeah, this message was so clear. Like I heard words. Because usually it's the other senses that I'm relying on. But everyone. This is why I like to think of it in the sense of senses. Everyone can see, smell, hear different degrees. Some senses are stronger or weaker. And some, they might not be able to see, but they can smell or hear. They can still do other aspects, other senses. Like with Charlie's List, mine's very opposite in the way where I hear very well, but I don't see very well. You also smell. I smell, yeah. I have a strong sense of smell, which always cracks me up when I run around the hunter tracking my smell. <laughs> it's so funny because smells move very beyond. It's always interesting. Just the other day, the Norse Witch on her channel put out a video called How to Train Your Psychic Abilities. It is such a good video. She actually will lead you through a practice in there on how to determine which of these abilities you have and which ones are strongest for you and which ones you might want to start training with. It's a really good video. I highly recommend you go checking that out on YouTube if you don't know where your strengths lie, but everyone has a strength somewhere. And also, I just love her channel. You should check it out if you're not familiar with it. And just through practice and training, you, you can learn to be better with a lot of your senses, and it's the same thing in the other, just through practice and training. And also, there's various tools that can help enhance senses, and it's the same thing. That's where those focusing tools you know, that you don't have to have, but sometimes it's nice to have. Uh, we don't spend money on, we, as we said, but it's nice to have. This, it's good to know what you have natural talent with to start yes. there. Because sometimes, and I find this very often, that we want talents that we don't naturally have. Yeah. You can develop them as skills, but start with your innate talents. Number four, there is no right way to do magic, but there is a wrong way to do magic. I want to start with the controversy now, <laughs> okay? This is where core things come in and building up those core things because there are many different ways magic can manifest and be in your life and you can practice and partake and, and play in. But if you think back to when we were talking about like the five powers, you can enter into folly 
very easily. That's something that's core so that I try to remind myself to walk through those steps over and over again to help avoid folly. If you missed that episode, we did an episode on it not that long ago. You can go back and check that out. Yeah. Treating others as you want to be treated, that is core because that keeps me from engaging in magical practices to violate others' wills. Because it, that is a temptation that's out there. When getting into Here. the, I would say, delicate arts of hexing and cursing, there are right ways of doing it, and there are definitely wrong ways. That gets into my next one, number five. The, the universe doesn't work the way we want it to. I do not believe in karma. I don't believe that you get what you give. I do not believe that there's an equivalent exchange. I think that's a wonderful idea for like full metal alchemist, but that's not how reality works. I do believe in the law of the returning tide, which means we put stuff out and the tide's going to bring back in whatever it brings back in. It could bring back in driftwood messages in a bottle. You don't know what the tide's going to yeah. bring in. So in my practice, which is rooted in Irish magic and then the fa fairy fate, cursing's not seen as a bad thing, but, and here's the thing. That's because we're putting justice out. It's, it's For the most part, it's not petty revenge or anything like that. But you never know what's going to come back to you. If you put justice out into the world and you have an injustice in your own life, justice might sweep back in on you and call you out on that thing. But you don't know. This idea of the equivalent exchange that you get back what you put in is not how the universe works. Now, the exception to this, and this is why we want to work in communities and make our communities stronger, is if all of us are putting good things out, the likelihood good stuff are going to come back in is higher. But if all of us are putting out crap, see Twitter, crap's what's going to come back. It's kind of the same thing when you're looking at environmentalism and, and that kind of stuff. So at an individual level, what we're doing to the environment's not really going to have that much of an effect. The environment's probably going to correct it. We put out, if I go and tear down my entire yard and turn it to dirt tomorrow, that's not really going to matter much. But on the grander scheme of things, enough people that go out and turn their yard to dirt and tear down all the plants and trees and everything, the oxygen level is going to lower. Yeah. Like, enough people do it, it can be a lot less oxygen in the air. Like, just in general, like the temperature will rise, it, it'll cause mass problems. And that, that's that thing. So bear that in mind. While I know a lot of us have solitary practices, I'm not saying you have to join a coven. That's not actually the message here. It's about working in your community to raise the consciousness of your community so that the community that you live in is putting the good stuff out. We're, we're living in a country where we just reap some bad stuff because a lot of people put out bad stuff. Some of us were putting out good, but that's not what came back on the tide. And that's how the returning tide works and why I like that analogy. Because you don't get back what you put in. You might, but you're going to get something back. It might be jellyfish and it might get stung all over your feet. You just don't know. So don't take it personally. There's no law of equivalent exchange. Number six, I would, I want to go ahead and take a moment and talk about discernment, taking some time to discern. This is important in all of the magical practices, especially with when interacting with spirits, but what it, it covers in all of that, it's taking that moment to break the thing down, to understand that it is what it actually is. Now it's not the end all because you can get lost in trying to understand the origins of something or breaking it down, but just taking a moment, simple discernment, simply going, what is this at its core? What is the energy that it is actually aligned with? So that you know, if you're dealing with the spirit, you think that they're bringing you good news or doing all this good stuff, but its energy is say mischievous. If you discern the energy is mischievous, the message might be fun and wonderful, but is it, or is it, fun and wonderful for them because what you might do with it could be entertaining. And so, yes, discernment, discernment, discernment. Discernment, had, discernment, discernment. I had many moments of folly because I didn't take time for discernment in my past, and, and especially early on in my practices. Number seven, don't take it too seriously. I think this is something a lot of us, especially when we're new to the craft or new to the practice, we really get wrong. I did this really the wrong way because I got started with Hermetic Ritual Magic and everything is so dramatically written and everything is so just over the top. Don't take it all too seriously. Magic, like any of the arts, needs a bit of fun and a bit of spontaneity. 
if you're really going to get the most out of it. Also, I find personally, when you take the magic too seriously, you don't put in the energy that you think you are going to, because you're spending way too much time being worried about, do I have all of the right ingredients? Do I have all of the right things? Is everything going to work perfectly? The time, the day, the hour, uh, and it keeps you from doing anything then, or all yep. that anxiety and concern oh, yeah. drains your power. And then when you actually do the working, you have just this little yeah. into the universe towards your actual intention. Or even yeah. worse, that becomes the energy that you actually put into the practice. Yeah. Instead of putting in the energy you meant to put in, you put in all that anxiety and worry and dread. I, I have known a couple <laughs> witches in my life that their magic was all dedicated to doing beautiful, beautiful rituals and spells that never accomplished anything because all of their energy went into the crafting of the spell because they really did think that, you yeah, know, the magic will take care of itself. And no, don't take it too seriously. A An impromptu spell that you put all of your energy into will always be more effective than one that you've stressed over for months and have no energy left by the time you actually do it. Number eight. Number eight's a little more wordy. It's dealing with sacred spaces. And along with that, the drawing of circles, you're creating the sacred circle, which is creating your sacred space. I I wish early on I had spent a lot more time understanding what they are and how they work for any practitioner, but if, especially if you're starting out, spend a lot of time here first. Understand what a sacred space is, how it is created, how it is defined, when you should leave it and when you should end it, when you should maintain it and reinforcing it because this is something you're going to do over and over again in your practice whether you're consciously aware that you're doing it or unconscious there are people who work in the office five days a week 40 hours a week they spend in their office space they have created a sacred space with all the little tchotchkes around their desk and they have no idea they would never call themselves a, a, a witch or a magic practitioner but they have created a sacred space they have drawn a strong circle around their sacred workspace believe it or not and, under, and we've talked quite a bit before about sacred spaces, and we definitely will be talking more about yeah. them because um, it is so important. I just want to add a, a extension onto what you were saying. Remember that sacred doesn't always mean solemn. Yeah. I, I want to point out that the silliness and playfulness can and should be considered sacred as well. Now, there's time for solemnity and there's time for silliness. Well, I guess it was a good time to take a minute to... A sacred space is a space that has been set aside. It has been yeah. dedicated for a thing. Yep. So if you've dedicated that thing for work, that is a sacred workspace. It is just that. This is why when you have a, a special workplace space at the house and the kids come running in and doing things in it, they have defamed that sacred workspace because they brought things into it they, that, that wasn't supposed to be there, which is why on an unconscious level you get upset a little bit because they did whatever they did messing with it. It is recognizing that it is just a space that is set aside. And when you draw that line around that space, remember to set up the intentions for that space, to set up who is allowed in and who is not. And all of that goes into the process. So being more mindful of what that is when you first are doing that, it helps you to set those spaces up. I think a lot of people confuse sacred for solemn. Yes. That's not always true especially in a lot of the work that I do. One of the things I love about the work that I do and the craft that I participate in is how much laughter is involved. Every night when I am calling the angels and doing the prayers, one of the angels will just make me laugh. It's a different one yeah. each night, but one of them invariably makes me laugh. In the, in the middle of doing this ritual, I've got my hand cross in my hand and I'm, I'm doing the protections on the house and over us while we're sleeping. And... It's usually Michael. I'm not going to lie. It's usually Michael. But one of the, they'll just make you laugh. Laughter is power and it's very valuable in a sacred space. So don't think, oh, I messed it up because I laughed. I giggled. You know, sometimes that's part of the magic. This is why I wish, like for myself, I knew ahead of time because in the kitchen, I didn't realize I wasn't mindful when I set up the sacred space. And so it was a sacred space for chef work and then no one else was allowed. And I didn't realize I had set that up, but I would get angry when anyone violated that sacred space. And especially if they were moving or doing things in that, because now they're profaning the sacred space. And so there was this whole like emotional response. 
I didn't understand. And so with that understanding, I was able to go back and be like, okay, so all these people are allowed in this sacred space and these things are not going to be profaning the sacred space. So stuff can be moved or added to a degree. <laughs> and I was more mindful and able to make those choices consciously rather than just being a victim to the whims. Number nine. This one actually is a quote from Nietzsche. It's very important for our research work. Don't stare into the darkness, lest it stare back at you. This is a very, very important thing. We just did an episode on mystical, magical darkness, and I meant everything that I said in there. When I was younger, I was really interested in trying to dig into those unspoken places in those unexplored places. And sometimes here be dragons. Like sometimes those places are unexplored for a reason. And you need to be careful when you're veering off the road into some of those more unknown places. There may be a reason you've not heard about what goes on there. I don't want to scare anybody. I will say I, some of the few truly negative experiences I've had with magic were because of that. Because, well, nobody actually talks about this. Let's see why. What You're probably missing out on something. Everything else is so wonderful. Why not this? Oh, 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 if I can cover up a profanity word here, I effed around and found out and wished I hadn't. So just be mindful. Sometimes people not talking about a thing, it can be as important because when they do talk about a thing, because sometimes there, there are places on the map where there be dragons. And maybe it's a more dangerous to go than you want to veer into. And number 10, please don't be so flippant. Okay. We, we already covered, but don't take it too seriously. In line with this, the dark things out there and whatnot, don't take magic so flippantly. When I was practicing, I learned early on that there are forgivenesses, this, that, and the other. But it's if you take it too flippantly or, or do it without enough structure and i say enough structure because there's extremes on both ends yeah and it could be too much structure it could be too little structure you can end up in places you can end up in the deep end you can end up way over your head you can end up harming relationships that you may not not want to harm or you may not intend to harm and so going back to the five powers and that process this is discernment and all the other things we've talked about even earlier in this episode all kinds of culminates in you want to make sure you're taking choice in your action. You're acting with choice. You're not reacting. You never want to be reacting. Yes. Along with that choice that you're remembering, these are your core things. You're remembering not to be too serious. You're remembering that there are scary things out there that you definitely should not be messing with unless you feel that you're at a point in your life, at a point in the practice where you're able to handle what you're getting into because I know even for myself young and stupid and yes there is that safety guard out there because I've I've personally experienced it where yes God will not let you get into something that is more than you can handle it is an awkward and strange experience when God has to step into your personal life and go I'm hitting the reset button I'm moving you back over here into the safety zone because you're way out of your player level also, you get to remember <clears throat> that it's a very uncomfortable place when you're at your limit. Oh, yeah. Even, at your, even at your limit. Yeah. But I've jumped into deep, choppy waters that I should have never been with. It was way out of my depth. And I had to have life reset on me. And that is a horrifying experience to personally go through. <laughs> it's something that I know we test all things and we prove and hold past that, which is true. But I want to warn everyone. You don't have to test this one. It is real. Don't go out there. Don't try to get it over your head. Because the problem is, is if, you, if it actually is something that you technically can handle, you're going to experience it fully. And it, if you're riding at your limit, you can still fail. And this one extends to a lot of other things as well. Like Surfeiter Magic is powerful and useful. But every time you create a Surfeiter, you are taking a bit of your own energy and locking it off you don't have access to it anymore so you are just walling off a bit of your own personal power to exist in there so if you're creating a whole bunch of servitors you yeah have a lot of aid out there making things happen but you are personally diminishing yourself in doing it so be mindful how many are you maintaining 
at a time? How are you actually do, doing the work? How often are you investing your own personal energy into your craft work and not drawing on the energies of nature or other spirits that you could be calling on instead? And is that causing you to be run down and not have the power that and the strength that you need to get to your particular daily life? Yeah, because you're you yourself are going to need a certain amount of energy for your functions and just daily life operations and just the general regeneration process and healing process that happens in internally on a daily basis just because living and making sure you have enough reserved. It's the same thing with spirit work. If you're making these contracts and stuff, you got to make sure your yes means your yes. You got to make sure you're careful with the fine print. I, I work for Bridget. And there are things that I have to do because of that. And I don't take that lightly. If you are making that kind of a contract with the spirit, you shouldn't take that lightly either. On the plus side, almost everything people are going to do can be forgiven, can be healed. That's it. Most. There are very few things that, that just can't. But that said, the pain, the suffering, the energy, the effort it takes to fix damage once it's done can be very tiresome. Yeah. I can't believe we got through 10 today. The sad thing is I can already think of a bunch more. So we may come back to this again, if you want to do 10 more things you know, that I wish I knew before I got started. Cause, oh, there's so much, but then again, like I said, I've been practicing, like if I go for Brian's rules, like yes, my entire life, I've been practicing more intuitive magic, but my intentional magical practice started in the early nineties and I've been doing this for a very long time. And so there's a lot of lessons that I've learned, but there's a lot of things that we could share. If you want to know more, we'd be really curious to know what are some things you wish you knew before you started the craft? Let us know. You can leave a comment right there underneath where you're listening to us. If you're listening to us on Spotify or YouTube, they will notify us and let us know if you're listening to us anywhere else. Even if they say you can leave a comment there they don't notify us. So we won't know that you did. And you can only check so many sites in a day. So you leave a comment there because engagement is magic. And then head over to creationspaths.com. Click on chat and you can leave a comment there. We'll see it and be able to respond. And I love hearing from you all. It, it really does brighten my day. But yeah, what, what do you wish you knew before you started the craft? What are some things I would love to have a conversation about it? And if you'd like us to do a 10 more, let us know as well. Because like I said, I can think of a bunch of things that we haven't gotten to yet. It'd be fun to add in a lot of the community's responses yeah. as well. And, to, and they follow all up. of that would be really fun and a follow up. So let, let us know while you're over at creationspass.com. If you have any money, you can pass our way. You can think about joining the membership over there it really does help us out. You can also support us on Kofi or Patreon. I am C Dorset on both. And that really does go a long way to help us keep food on our table, the lights on and a roof over our heads. And thank you to everybody who does that. It means the world to us. We're hoping to get to a place with the money coming in through support that we can maybe collectively pick a charity every month and start giving some of it to that and start pulling the money to that. But you got to cover our bills for first. So thank you to everyone who is helping us with that. As we're going out today, I feel like we should call on Oma for his guidance and protection. O oh, Oma, the great and wise warrior who gave us the Oum script and who taught us how to do so much of the magic. Guide us and help us as we are learning through these perilous times and challenge us like you did Lou when we think that we are talented at everything and protect us as you did the Tua. Amen. Amen. Amen.